friends just made a podcast. Two good friends just made a podcast. Two good friends just made a podcast. It's called Culture Bucket. Two good friends just made a podcast. Two good friends just made a podcast. Two good friends just made a podcast. Culture Bucket. Hello everyone and welcome back to the world, no, scratch that, the universe's greatest podcast. Um, <laughs> this is Culture Bucket, you are joining us on our 73rd episode, just um, 47 short episodes from the big 120, can't wait for that. And uh, you're joining us this week for the second part of our big blowout special review of Midnight Mass, the um, great TV show on Netflix. Um, We're going to be covering the final four episodes in today's uh, episode, so if you haven't listened to last week's yet or watched Midnight Mass, please do go and do all of those things. Um, But we also have the usual Culture Catcher on MyTube and all those wonderful little features that you enjoy so much, Um, so please do listen for all of that. And I am your host, George, and joined is me by... Joining me by... I am joined by... (laughs) I am... Today I am joined by, as always, my co-host, Alex. Hi, Alex. Hi George, hi everyone. How are you doing today, George? Wonderful, thank you. Full of energy, full of beans, full of beans, full of beans. Um, yeah, no, good. It's, everything's good. How are you feeling? Great. Yes, yes. It's nearly nearly the end of the school year for us in Italy, and I'm very excited. It is nearly nearly the end of the school year. Uh, I've got yeah. a little bit, little bit longer to go, but it'll happen. I'll get there. Yeah, it will happen. Yeah. It happened. And after two years, a full school year is pretty crazy. So I am done. <laughs> I am done for this year. <laughs> yes, me too. Um, but let's, let's not worry about that. Let's worry about um, the world of, of popular culture Ooh. and what we've been doing in it and catching up on that with our Culture Catch-Up Go. This is Culture Catch-Up Time. This is where we talk about what we've watched, what we've read, what we've listened to, and probably some other stuff. <laughs> so I'm starting this week. <laughs> yeah, George? Yes, please. Uh, I'm uh, uh, going to uh, discuss a, a second uh, a series and a film I have watched. Um, I'm going to start with the film I finally uh, watched after a long time that I've been wanting to watch it, but I don't know, it always slipped my mind. Uh, is a 2018 film called A Simple Favour. Ah, uh, ha, ha, with, um, with Anna, Anna Kendrick. Kendrick, Blake Lively, yes. Henry, Gold- Henry Golding, etc., yes. etc. Et I saw this film in the cinema. Oh, did you? Mm, um, and uh, it's kind of like a comedy drama thriller, drama comedy thriller. Psychological thriller. Psychological yeah. thriller with some comedic like Dark aspect. comedy, black comedy, yeah. Black comedy, yes. And it's about Stephanie, played by Anna Kendrick, who's a single mother and who has got a blog and has got her, um, seems to be her life together. She's a very hands-on mother. I guess, a bit mm-hmm. obsessive with her her son. And she uh, strikes a friendship with another mother, which is kind of the opposite of her, uh, played by Blake Lively, uh, who loves uh, drinking a lot. There's the scene with the martini, which I've seen so many times on YouTube. It always pops up on something when she's making this martini, Blake Lively. And after maybe a few weeks of friendship, um... The Emily Nelson, uh, the her, her new best friend, um, disappears, and uh, she tries to find her with the help of her husband, the husband, Emily Nelson's husband. Um, I I don't know how I felt about this film. I love Anna Kendrick and anything she is in, but I felt very underwhelmed by the story um and i don't know why i didn't i I, there there didn't seem to be much originality or in it things kind of happened a bit too 
easily in it, I guess. I really wanted to like it because I love the, the actors. I just didn't enjoy the story. It was just a little bit too maybe naive and simple for me. Mm. Uh, so yeah i don't i don't know what what did you think of this film well it's a a while since i watched it i remember enjoying it Mm. um you know because i really like the cast and it was you know it's a paul feige movie right paul no yeah what's his name feig paul feig Feig. um paul feig movie and i generally you know enjoy his films but it definitely Mm. seems like a lesser effort from him in mm. terms of it's not that memorable i remember the big twist um being i remember what the big i remember i remember what the big twist is but i don't remember why that's the twist or like how it all plays out and stuff mm. but i remember feeling it's probably s- s- more positive than you but also still slightly underwhelmed in terms of yeah it's not i was ex- i was i wanted something more thrillery you know something yeah. that m- more that that the twi- I, I wanted a bigger twist I I just wanted something more, a bit more exciting, you know. It just felt a little bit like Gone Girl, but not good. Yeah, it's like Gone Girl light. Yeah, light Gone Girl, yeah. and we could it could have done better. And you know, I think Harry Golding is a good actor, and I think here he was just <laughs> bad. <laughs> Fair enough. I, I, I genuinely, I don't remember him in it. But. Yeah, exactly. It's just so vanilla and you go, oh. Um, yeah, I didn't, I didn't particularly um, care for it. Also, the vlogging thing just seemed really surreal. Like somebody they've never seen a vlog. I don't know. It just felt like really haphazard. But, you know. Um, and then, and then uh, the uh, I, I, I started watching uh, the second series of uh, Russian Doll. Oh. The series Russian Doll. Yes. Um, the, it, the series created by uh, Natasha Lyon, uh, Leslie Headland, and Amy Paula. Um, I was before I loved the first season. I don't know if you watched it. Yes, I love I love. Yes. And it was really, really good. And you know, Natasha Leon is incredible in it. She's so she's amazing. I, I loved her from the start and I'm, I'm happy to see her uh, having her own kind of show on her time. Definitely. Um and in the first season, uh she is uh it's her bir- it's the night of her birthday party mm-hmm. or the her actual birthday and uh she is caught in a time loop. Mm-hmm. Um and she, every time she and she realizes that every time she dies she goes back to the same start mm-hmm. and uh, until um and and then she meets this man that's experienced the same thing and they kind of manage to get out of the loop mm-hmm. uh in season two and i was wondering how are they going to do this again yeah. have they not gone out of the loop but it's season two um it is set 10 days before she's about to celebrate her 40th birthday yes and she takes a train the sixth train and the sixth train sends her back into 1982 uh and she is now not in a time loop but she is trapped in her mother's body Mm -hmm. and she's experiencing her mother when she was pregnant with her during that time and she decides to uh pers- so in the first season we find out that she's got this like medal like this gold coin around a her neck Krugerand, a, a South Krugerand. African Krugerand. and we discover and then we she what she does she decides to pursue these Krugerands that her mother lost when she was pregnant or sold to change the course of her family history mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um I've watched the first four episodes, and I think there are seven. Mm-hmm. I'm enjoying it, but there's a lot going on. Uh, <laughs> have you have you been watching it? I've finished it. I've watched all. Of ah, it. you finished it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a lot going on, and I'm I'm like it's getting better. The more the series is going on, but I'm just so confused <laughs> you know me and like too much information yeah, yeah, and yeah. so uh, i'm 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 going with it because i love natasha leon and i love how she 
just acts and how she is in this series. Mm -hmm. But it is a lot, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's more ambitious than the first season. Yeah. Um, uh, Which was already extremely ambitious. Yeah. But it asks you to kind of go in a lot of different directions. Yeah. But two things that I love about it. Number one, Annie Murphy is in it. Who yeah. we've discussed at great length before from yeah. bringing Kevin Kneff himself. Amazing. Et and what a casting. Yeah. Of course she's Rufy. Yeah. Like I was just like, that's a perfect casting. Very good casting yeah. choice. And yeah. you know, she's great in this and she's great in everything. And also the music is continues to be great. Um, yeah. There are some great uh, music choices and needle drops and yeah. stuff in the second season, yeah. uh, including Bella Lugosi's Dead by Bauhaus, which is uh, good. And um, yeah. Mother by Danzig. Yeah, really good songs. Um but yeah, it's, uh, I don't, I think ultimately I prefer the first season, mm. but only in a world where we hear it, where we are by necessity, it, like we have to rank everything as being worse or better than what came before. Yeah. Kind of thing. Like it doesn't matter that it's not quite as good as the first season. It's still great that Natasha Leone mm. is out there making stuff like this and is able to make this. And it's still a really entertaining, ambitious, weird, cool sci-fi thing. And um, I hope that, if she wants to make another season of it, she can. And if she doesn't want to, she gets to do whatever else she wants to do because she's, yeah. um, she's a great creative mind. And, yeah. yeah, definitely. I like the fact that she, she the show is the same, but she went through a different kind of concept of time travel. Yeah. So the first one was like time loop and this is time travel. Yeah. Uh, and it'd be interesting if she does a third series, if there'd be another concept of time, like future i don't know something i don't know i think or... the future right because she's yeah first season she was stuck in the present just yeah. permanently stuck in the present yeah second season she keeps going to the past into so past. third season you gotta go will into be the, the future, future. Yeah. i don't know but yeah and Chloe sevigny plays her mother mm-hmm. and i think that's also really good at casting yeah also because i haven't seen chloe sevigny in so long yeah but she was in anything. the first season as well wasn't she briefly yeah, no, I can't remember. There's there's an ep- there's at least one episode that has a quite a ah uh, yeah yeah what, yeah, yeah you're right you're right watermelons in the car and stuff. Yes, yeah, you're right. Um, yeah. but she gets a much expanded role in this one, and it's, yeah, it's, definitely, it's great. And uh, Charlotte Copley, there's a lot of odd little almost cameos. Um, mm. do you know Charlotte Copley? Is South African actor. He was in District Nine and has popped up in loads of stuff, and he plays the. A guy in the first episode of this who is, um, like with her mum, in the past, mm. who's involved yeah, I didn't in know stealing him, no. the yeah. clients. He's quite a big, like, movie star actor. That guy, um, okay, and always turns in really odd performances, and again turns in a really odd performance in um, in Russian Doll. Yeah, no, yeah, and I, it's uh, it's good. I I like it, and I haven't seen Ben yet much. Um, so I don't know if he's going to be more present in the next few episodes, like in the first season. Yeah, you'll, there's, his connection to her story is you have to pay quite close attention, I think, to get the most out okay. of it in the second season. But he does okay. He does get his share of the focus, I think, but okay, maybe well, slightly yeah. reduced from season one. Okay. But he's good. Yeah. I like I'm excited him. to see what's going to happen. And I'll let you know next week yeah. how... How I feel about it. I don't. I don't. I don't <laughs> think you could predict. No, I. But I. Every episode is like, what? Why is she do? <laughs> what? Um. Yeah. Yeah. I'm very, very mesmerizing. Like, kind of, it, it grabs your attention quite a bit, mm. and I love the fact that in the New York Library, you know, you can just research stuff. You had to like ask them. Yeah. Ask the librarian, and then the librarian would research it for you. You would leave your number, and then they would phone you with information. Isn't like that bizarre? how that's so bizarre. And you, <laughs> how do you, how did we find people then? It's crazy how we 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 could find information, people, places without our phones, and now we can't even like <laughs> do anything. No. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah, agreed. But yeah. And that's it for me this week. Um, how about you this week, Mr. L- George? <laughs> well, um, a couple of things. Uh, number one, my, my Netflix adventures this week have been centred around my excitement for the imminent return of Stranger Things, 
which is coming ah. at the end of May with season four. So I decided to, because I think this, I can't remember when the third season of, the, of Stranger Things was on, but it was a while ago and I've completely forgotten almost all of it. And actually mm. had started to convince myself that I didn't really like Stranger Things that much because it's been mm. so long since it was on. Um, so I decided to rewatch it and burn through the first two seasons in about four days because it is, oh, wow. I'd, I'd forgotten how much I like Stranger Things. It's, it is okay. so incredibly brilliant, uh, especially the first season. Um, mm. So I'm, I'm really excited for the, for the new one of that, which is coming uh, part one on the 27th of May and part two on, I think, the 1st of July. Um, is this the last one? No, penultimate season. Wow. So there'll be one more. There'll be Stranger Things 5. Um, and then that's apparently going to be the end. Um, and it's, it's, it's weird watching the first season, which was on in 2016 and then watching the trailers for the new season and how much older all the child actors look now, um, than they were in the first season. Um, and also reminded by like how lucky they got with casting on that show because all of the, all of the child actors they cast are great and like really, Mm. really, um, have kind of kept the show as good as it is, is is how good their performances are. Like especially Millie Bobby Brown as Eleven, um, mm. and Finn Wolfhard as uh, Mike, at the centre of all of it. But also, 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 like firmly one of the greatest TV characters of all time is David Harbour's Sheriff Hopper, who is great. Um, mm. And I can't wait to see his sort of uh, what they do with his character in the next season. Anyway, um, I also went to the cinema this week to see the latest entry in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. Exciting. Yeah. Uh, well, it was interesting because before, like in the days leading up to its release, all, all the reviews started coming out and they were pretty mixed across mm. the board. Um, some reviews just calling it a mess. Some reviews <laughs> saying it's okay. And then a handful yeah. of reviews saying it's brilliant. Um, so polarizing. And quite often I tend to like movies like that. So it made me like nervous, but really interested to see it because mm. um, I like movies that take kind of big swings and et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, so I went along on opening day, all excitable to watch it, particularly excited as it has been directed by Sam Raimi, who directed mm-hmm. the original Tobey Maguire Spider-Man trilogy, along with the original Evil Dead movies um, and, a, and, you know, a bunch of other really good stuff. And I'm a big, big fan of his filmmaking style where he really... Like when he's at his best, he he has the camera feel present in his mm. scenes as a character, almost moving around the scenes in a way that a lot of other directors don't do. Like he gets motion out of his camera in a way that a lot of directors won't. Um, like really famously, just attaching the camera to his head in one of the Evil Dead movies and run, <laughs> running at Bruce Campbell to like create the effect of like a force and mm. entity kind of rushing at him and things like that. And he just yeah, a really really good director and. Um, this film, let's see, it follows, it's the second Doctor Strange movie, but it feels like the third or fourth because he's been in all these other movies. Like his, the first Doctor Strange movie came out in 2016, which is yeah. what, six years ago. So, oh my goodness. Yeah, he's <laughs> <a> long ago. <laughs> popped up in various yeah. Avengers movies and things since, um, mm. since his initial movie. So, you know, he feels like kind of a well-worn character at this point. Um, it kind of, the, one main criticism I'd have of the movie is that it, it feels like one chapter in a larger story because mm. it opens immediately with like a big action scene and a load of exposition and you're introduced to like an alternate version of Doctor Strange. You know, this is a multiverse movie, so we're going to get alternate versions of characters. So you, yeah. immediately there's a, there's a different Doctor Strange and you know he's different because he's got a ponytail. Mm. And he's, he's running along a big CGI thing being chased by a big, bandage demon thing and he's got this young girl with him who's got a uh, jacket on with a big star on the back and if you know your marvel you know that that's america chavez who has a, the power of being able to punch holes between multiverses and travel between universes which makes sense they introduce her in this movie because it's all about that um and ultimately the movie ends up being about um doctor strange in our universe so the doctor strange that she's with in the very opening part of the movie 
is attempting to keep her safe from this demon that's chasing her and he fails in that mission and she ends up being flung mm. into our universe or our, our version of the MCU's universe okay. where she is immediately attacked by a giant eyeball tentacle thing <laughs> um, and that's where our version of Doctor Strange gets involved because it happens right next to a wedding he's attending because he is at the wedding of Christine the um, character played by Rachel McAdams who is his love interest in the first movie but he's unfortunately not managed to um, you know, stick through it with her and she's now marrying somebody else. Reach a bit cut, Nick, but... Ah, no, okay, okay, sorry, sorry. You all right? Sorry, I got confused with actresses. <laughs> I was thinking about the one that is Lois Lane. What's her name? Amy Amy Adams. Amy Adams. Yeah. Sorry, no, I just okay. had him, I was like... <laughs> We can't have the same actress being the love interest twice. No, it's not okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so he sees this all happening at this wedding and in gets involved and is suddenly sent on a big multiverse ripping quest to protect America Chavez from a character who wants to um, take her multiverse hopping powers for themselves. And I won't spoil who that character is because... They've kind of cleverly kept it hidden in the trailers who the villain of the movie is, and I'm not going to ruin that now for anyone. But um, no, this isn't no, a spoiler. Because I might be able to watch it this week. Oh, hopefully, exciting. So, oh. But um, what I so ultimately, yeah, I loved it. Oh, of course it did. No, I feel like such <laughs> a corporate shell. Um, <laughs> Why? Because it's because because because. I, get, I feel like I've been giving every Marvel movie five stars recently, but they've, really, they've been they really been good. good. Um, yeah. And this one is, like, it is crazy. It was it, it was rumoured before it came out that it was going to have loads of big cameos in it, and it doesn't have quite as many big cameos as people maybe expected, but it's got a couple of corkers that really... <laughs> I was really excited about. And, um, you know, I really like... Lovecraftian, like we've talked, we've talked a lot yeah. about this, but I like weird Lovecraftian kind of cosmic horror stuff. And mm-hmm. this Doctor Strange movie is filled with that kind of thing. And in particular, Sam Raimi, in a way that only Taika Waititi and James Gunn have managed to do before, he's managed to make a Marvel movie that really feels like one of his films where the camera is zooming around all over the place. Mm. There are sequences where characters are getting possessed by other characters and he uses his camera in the same way he used it in the evil dead movies to represent the force there where it's kind of spying on people and hiding behind things and moving around. And it feels like you're the point of view of this demonic entity, um, which is scary for like a, a Marvel movie, like a genuinely scary at times. Um, I mean, not genuinely scary, but like, to, 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 a, to a young audience would probably feel genuinely scary um i think benedict cumberbatch is brilliant in this like you've got to get over the fact that he's doing this like hugh laurie-esque generic american accent in the role but he's been doing mm-hmm. it ever since 2016 so that's just that is our doctor strange so we'll we'll have to go with it um elizabeth olsen obviously is in the trailers for this playing uh wanda maximoff of scarlet witch she's i really liked her in the in this film um i won't talk too much about what she does in it because to talk more about the plot is like a spoiler, but she's she's good in it. Benedict Wong as Wong gets a lot of good stuff to do in it and is great. Yeah. Um, the actress that plays America Chavez um, does end up feeling a little bit like a MacGuffin that other people are kind of fighting over, and she maybe doesn't get too much of her own sort of character growth and and doing her own thing. But I think she's been introduced in this movie with the eye to being a bigger part in the future so i'm hoping that we get much more of her because she's good and the, she's played by an actress called well her surname is gomez and her first name is spelled oh oh, oh that's tells you on wikipedia has to, so her name her first name is spelled x-o-c-h-i-t-l apparently pronounced so she so she so 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 she gomez plays uh, mm. America Chavez, is really, really good in it, like really, really liked her. Rachel McCarrams gets more to do than she got in the first Doctor Strange movie, and I, I, I thought she was great, mm. really enjoyed her. Um, a bunch of people turn up from all over the Marvel Universe, and they're all, you know, dependably enjoyable. Um, in particular, Shuitel Ejio 4, who played um, Baron Mordo in the first Doctor Strange movie and hasn't reappeared in the MCU since, um, gets, mm-hmm. gets some good stuff to do in this film. And... Um, 
it's just got this tone that I really liked of creepy horror mixed with goofy, odd nonsense. And it's exactly the kind of thing that Sam Raimi likes to make. So it makes sense that he joined it. Mm. Um, the reviews that her the reviews that are critical on it are interesting. Um, some of the some of the complaints are that it it doesn't feel like a Sam Raimi movie, and it just feels like another like. But it, we seem to be at this point now where it's okay to just criticize the Marvel movies for being Marvel movies, but ultimately, <laughs> that's what they are. They are Marvel movies. They're made yeah. by a big corporation. Yeah. They're churned out factory style. Yeah. And as movies, they're not going to be high art. They're just meant to entertain us with like big CGI superhero yeah. nonsense. And if they can within that add in some individuality and, and interest in, you know, stuff, that's that's good like it doesn't stop yeah like it doesn't stop films like everything everywhere all at once happening which is a better movie and is like a masterpiece of cinema mm -hmm. and of like yes that film is better and is more artistic but i i still like that you know i still like the marvel films i enjoy them i'd like superhero stuff it's fun and it's yeah, entertaining. Can we not have some fun? Do we do we only only have to have a high brow yeah. uh, movies? I think, Although I think to, they're, to, they're great. To be clear, the great thing about everything everywhere all at once is that it is fun as well as being high art. Like Yeah, but oh also my it's God. like if the Marvel yeah. movies could be as good as everything everywhere all at once, like we would yeah. be living in a in a utopian world, but we're not living in a, <laughs> a utopian world, so we make do with what we have. And okay. you know, we've got Disney out here making Marvel films and we've got A twenty four out here making their own stuff yeah. and the fact that both those entities are successful and popular at the moment is good. Mm. So yeah, I liked I liked Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness a lot. Um I can't wait to talk more about some of the things in it that we can't really talk about yet because it's too early and you haven't seen it. But um no. there were some really cool bits and pieces in this movie. Um yeah, people should go and watch it. And I think, uh, you know, at the moment on, on Rotten Tomatoes, for example, it's, it's critic score is like 76% or something, which is positive. It's like it's still generally getting good reviews, but its audience mm. score is higher in like 88% 80, or so. So I think people are mm. liking it. People are enjoying it. I really hope that the slightly muted critical response doesn't stop Sam Raimi from making another one if he wants to. Like if, if Sam Raimi wants to do a third Doctor Strange movie, I really hope he does because I'd, I'd happily watch him make another one i thought he did a great job so yeah there we go that's the um that's doctor strange in the multiverse of madness the next thing i have to talk about is um i'll try and be brief but it's pretty oh so i i read something i read something okay which I, what did you read so not a, like a book not well you read a book a, i read a graphic novel okay or a comic book um yeah because I've... It, marry Me? Did you read Marry Me? Yes, I read all of Marry Me. I'm here to tell you about it. No. I read I read a, I read a comic book called Saga. Mm. Have you heard of Saga? No. Okay, so Saga is a comic series that has been running since tw 2012 and okay. is now kind of highly renowned in the comics world as being one of the best comics ever written, um, particularly outside of like the Marvel DC superhero stuff. It's written by Brian K. Vaughan. It's all written by Brian K. Vaughan, who wrote Why the Last Man and has written a load of other super, uh, comic book stuff over the years and is illustrated by Fiona Staples, who is mm. a genius. <laughs> like, I don't know if I've come across Fiona Staples' art before, but, like, this is the most beautifully illustrated comic book I have ever read in my life. And it is similar to what I said about Everything Everywhere All at Once last week. The imagery in these comics is you could take any single page of saga and it's filled with more imagination than most blockbuster movies it is glorious um it's a space wow. opera it's a space opera slash fantasy broadly inspired by star wars but very much for adults um mm. the the opening page of the very first issue is features one of the main characters giving birth and you go from there and it's you know it's all fairly graphic um it follows Two, it follows a husband and wife, Alana and Marco, um, who are star-crossed lovers who have, um, in the opening issue, um, Alana gives birth to their daughter, Hazel, who narrates the entire series as, a, as an adult, um, 
you never see her, but you see her voiceover or like script writing mm. over um, through the various issues, kind of describing and, and adding some colour commentary to, to the events that you see occurring um, through her childhood. And you sort of follow through the eyes, through Alana and Marco's adventures, you follow, you see her grow up. Um, so like the the ish, issue one is where she's born and the issue that I'm up to now, which is the most recent issue published, she's like 10 years old. So you kind of go through her, mm. her life. Um Alana and Marco are from different alien species. Um, Alana comes from a planet. I can't remember the name of the planet, but basically Alana comes from a planet where everyone who lives on the planet has wings of some Mm -hmm. kind. And then Marco comes from the moon of this planet. And everyone who lives on the (laughs) moon of the planet has horns. So it's like the Mm. wings versus the horns. And because... They like if the if the horns attacked the planet that the wings live on, then the, their moon would be destroyed. If they destroyed that planet, the moon would be flung out of orbit. Mm. But equally, if the wings destroyed the moon of their planet, that would cause all sorts of problems for them as well. So they have outsourced their war to planets and and galaxies all across the solar system um, that the that the comic is set in, which is like a really interesting initial idea. And um, Alana and Marco were fighting on opposite sides and met and fell in love and abandoned the war and are obviously highly wanted um, for, you know, their daughter, Hazel, has horns and wings, so Mm. is considered to be an abomination and people are chasing after them to kill her and kill the parents, etc. And the whole story kind of follows their attempts to survive and form a family and is far more, you know deep and rich and layered than you would ever expect from a comic book um Mm. i like i've started reading like on my tablet i've started reading comics recently i'm like there's an app called comiXology which is linked to amazon and there was a few different comics i've been interested in reading uh sweet tooth maniac of new york um i can't remember what the other ones were bone was another one there's a few different comics and i and on comiXology you can download a sample of the first issue of like all these comics and all of these comics were like 10 pounds. So I was like, Oh, I'll buy one of these and and read through it. And then I was like, Oh, Saga's meant to be good as well. And I looked in Saga, like the big companion of of all of Saga Mm. up to this point, which is like, um, they ran until about 2017 and where they got through to issue 54 and the whole plan is for it to be 108 issues. So at that halfway point, they took a hiatus. So the collected, the collected omnibus of issues one through 54 was like 35 pounds. And I was like, well, I'm not going to, by that but i'll i was like i'll download the sample of that just in case and i read through the samples of all the others and i was like hmm i can't really decide what which one i want to read and i was like oh, i'll just read the sample of saga just to see and because the full thing is like 1300 pages long you actually get quite a lot for free you get like three or four issues for free and i was reading through it and i was like oh this is amazing this is one of the best <laughs> like within within about 100 pages i was like this is one of the best things i've ever read in my entire life so yeah i ended up buying the full thing and just sitting for hours and hours and hours and reading through all of it cuz it's like a massive huge um saga at this point so there's a lot to get through and like like i said like just endless endless pages of gorgeous beautiful art and really funny writing and it is is genuinely one of the best things i have ever read ever one of yeah, the best i'm looking at the artwork is amazing it's really amazing right like fiona staples is so yeah so good um anyone who has a tablet or device that they can read graphic novels on and comics download the comicsology app and download the free sample of the saga compendium to get those first few issues for free and have a read through them because you'll i mean it's just so it's so 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 good um so yeah i i fell completely in love with saga and now i was like it's i was trying to work it out it's going to be another four or five years before they finish or even longer so i'm gonna be it feels exciting to be in the middle of something rather than finding it Mm. i often find things like this after they've all finished yeah but now i'm like a fan and i'm in it (laughs) for for the long haul for the for the long haul. yeah amazing so yeah god saga go and read it it's 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 incredible I recommend it to everyone. Nice. Yeah. Um, right, that's all my culture catch up. Nice. Thanks. Um, <laughs> do you want to do a bit of my tube? Yeah, always. Okay.
I've got a couple of trailers prepared. I'll send you the first one over Facebook. Um, I don't know if you'll have seen these or not. Okay. Oh, I haven't seen the trailer for this. Oh, I'm interested so, to think So, George then. has sent me the trailer for Obi-Wan Kenobi, official Disney Plus. Yes, trailer. please. Um, yeah, pretty excited to see this. So let's see what you yeah. think. Yeah, and trailer. I can't believe Ewan McGregor is doing it again. I know, That's insane. Like I wasn't expecting him to be Obi Wan. I not be. I agree, but I am a big. I mean, I I really like Ewan McGregor. So let's, yeah, let's hope this so. is good. Okay, you ready to start? Yeah. Okay, three, two, one, go. Oh, it looks exciting. There's a spaceship. He's landing. Oh, Star Troopers. Star Troopers. Storm Troopers, even. Storm Troopers. <laughs> Storm Troopers are there. Evil looking people. Evil people. Survive. And there's a desert. And what? Is that, is that little, Skywalker? Little Luke Skywalker. Is that Luke? <gasps> it's before the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, of course it is. I wasn't, I wasn't thinking about that. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So, oh. yeah, it's set nine years before the original Star Wars. I think this could be exciting. I agree. Oh, Darth has been born. Sorry, I didn't say much during this trailer, but it's really exciting. I'm like, ah, my mouth is open. <laughs> so Ah, that's exciting. So it's nine years before uh, the episode... It's set between episode three and four. Three and four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's between when episode three and four. Obi-Wan is in his kind of self-imposed hiding on Tatooine, observing the growth of uh, Luke. Mm. Yeah. Um mm. exciting. I think it'll look good. I think I think probably Star Wars going into episodes and mini series is probably the best. Yeah, well way it's interesting because the Man the Mandalorian was great. Yeah. But then the Book of Boba Fett was ugh, quite a big miss. I haven't I didn't watch that. No, one. I wouldn't uh, even that well, the only reason I'd watch the Book of Boba Fett is because it it's also like a half Half of it is a third season of The Mandalorian. Well, it feels like okay. two, season 2.5 of The Mandalorian and then also mm. some Boba Fett stuff. It's a weird, odd thing. Mm. Um, what uh, Worth watching if you want to know the whole story, but not too important other than that. But then this Obi-Wan Kenobi show, it's interesting because it's set way before The Mandalorian or anything. So it's, it's mm. set... The timeline of Star Wars is getting strange, but... Other than that, I'm pretty excited to see this show. I hope it's good. Yeah. Um, Hayden Christensen is returning as Darth Vader, which is I'm fascinated to see how that what? all pans out. Yeah. <laughs> oh no. Um. And. I mean, I I I think he'll be. I I think that no one could have been good with the dialogue that 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 character was given in the the prequels. No, that was just terrible. Yeah. It was bad. So, yeah. you know, given given a better creative team around him, you know, hopefully Hayden Christensen can redeem himself a little bit. Um yeah. and we'll Let's we'll hope. see what happens. But I'm 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 really excited. Yeah. I'm really, really good. excited. I think that's coming around the end of May. 
um 27th 27th so, so like the weeks. same day as stranger things oh not gonna see your hear for yeah. uh, from george for a while yeah well that was, disney plus do it the way where they they do one episode a week don't they so it'll just be the one yeah. episode of that then whereas uh stranger things is dropping half its season on uh the 27th anyway that was that then here's a second thing to uh see what you think of this okay so the next trailer that george has sent me is weird the al yankovic story al yankovic why does it ring a bell well I'll see what you think as we watch the trailer okay are you ready I'll to go the trailer yeah okay three two one go okay why it ring- the name rings a bell which i'm really confused about six platinum records five grammys so it's about a singer, the untold true story. Who's Al Yankovic? Hope you guys are ready for this. Yeah! <laughs> uh, what? So, oh, what? Is that Daniel Radcliffe? Yep. Yeah, it, in a really weird uh, afro... And moustache. And... Anyone got an accordion? Who's that? Who's that Yankovic? He does all the parody songs. Ah! Okay, so this is his story. Yeah, his, like, um, biopic film. But he does, like... Ah. um, He does... You'll have heard his songs. He does, like, parodies of all popular songs. So his, like, Like a Virgin is called Like a Surgeon. Yeah. And yes. he did... Um, a, Amish Paradise. Yeah, yes, Amish yes, Paradise. And White and Nerdy instead of Riding Dirty. And um, he did that, yes, he did that parody of Fancy by Gisela called yeah. um, Handy. Uh, and a parody of Happy called Tacky. Anyway, he's a weird guy. Yeah. But uh, and they're making a film about him. Yeah, with Daniel with Radcliffe. Daniel Radcliffe. <laughs> it looks pretty sweet. Yeah, it looks weird, which is yeah. appropriate because it's a weird idea. Um, yeah, yeah. There you go. What you gonna watch that? Probably, <laughs> but it's on. It's on this thing called Roku. What is Roku? I don't know. I'm sure it'll be on. Oh, okay. I'm sure it'll be on something at some point. Um, yeah. Or, I forgot it's called his name is Weird Al. That's why. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Weird Al Yankovic. Yeah. Weird Al. Um, cool. Okay. Awesome. Are you gonna watch it? Yeah, definitely. I'd I'd kind of like Weird Al's stuff and then Yeah. I like Daniel Radcliffe and it's a weird like when it came out that he was been cast as Weird Al in this film, people were like, What Daniel Radcliffe? What? But he sort of looks the part. It's in weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah it looks <laughs> really looks the part. Yeah, it's definitely. Right, shall we leap into the second part of our Midnight Mass review? Yeah, okay, from episode four, when things start becoming a little bit weird. Yes. so um, On this island. Yes, so if you didn't listen last week, Midnight Mass is the... Well, I, I mean, you should... What are you doing if you didn't listen last week? But anyway, back. Midnight Mass is the Mike Flanagan um, sort of uh, drama, thriller, horror, folk horror thing um, following the residents of Crockett Island um and how they are affected by the arrival of the new priest father paul uh when we left on the end of episode three um father paul had died and been reborn due to either a poisoning or drinking too much of vampire blood and um the jury's still out on that one and uh the reveal had been made that <laughs> yeah. father paul is in fact not the replacement for monsignor Pruitt. he is monsignor Pruitt revitalized and made young again through drinking the blood of what he believes to be an angel but what is certainly a vampire um he's a terrible angel yeah really bad angel he's really horrible looking yeah they do a great job of designing um that monster because yeah it's yeah, like it's a mo- it's a monster like, it's not even like a vampire he's just a a horrid creature. Yeah, it's like a... And it's like naked. It's like those sphinx cats with wings. Yeah, it's like very much a, <laughs> a monstrous take on the vampire myth. Um, yeah. Closer to a Nosferatu Count Orlok type than it is a... That's what I was thinking. Yeah. More like... That's what I wasn't thinking about Nos... I wasn't thinking about vampire. I thought like he was more like the devil. Yeah, 
But he does all like the vampire deep... stuff. Yeah, but, you know, we don't really know what a devil does, really, do we? No, true. But it... Because it does, it does bring the, the demon out of everyone, because everybody becomes awful. Yeah, yeah, but I guess, I guess my take on it is that I don't think of it as a devil because I think, or at least my reading on the whole show is that there's no religious element to the monster of any kind. Like it's not a yeah. religious beast. It's just a yeah. monster that he is like yeah. brought to this island. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How did he put him in? Oh my God. Like, how did he get it through customs and stuff? How did he get it exactly? How did he get this big <laughs> skinless bat? <laughs> for customs but he did it he, somehow he did well done um so we go to uh episode four or book four which is called lamentations um crockett island's resident doctor sarah gunning discovers that erin's fetus has mysteriously disappeared from her uterus oh, and concludes i was not expecting that erin has miscarried which is like one of one of those points where um it's a dark, like, you really start to see that the show isn't going to pull any punches at all and it's going to go really, <laughs> really dark. Yeah. Um, yeah. A distraught Erin travels to the mainland the next morning for a second opinion, but the doctor there cannot find any evidence that Erin was ever even pregnant. Father mm. Paul reveals that sunlight burns him after his resurrection and Bev deduces his true identity as Monsignor Pruitt. Unable to perform his duties in broad daylight, Paul performs an at-home Eucharist with Sarah's elderly mother, Mildred, who suffers from dimension, demen, dimension, dementia, <laughs> but recognises Paul as per it. Joe visits Father Paul that night and sees him drinking the angel's blood, which Paul has been diluting with communion wine and feeding to his congregation, naughty boy. Overcome by an insatiable thirst, Paul kills Joe and drinks his blood. Bad bloke, don't do that. Bev, Mayor Scarborough, and local handyman Sturge, another bad bloke, discover the scene the following morning. Bev elects to cover it up, believing Paul's resurrection to be an omen of the second coming of Christ. During an AA session, Paul claims to Riley that Joe is absent because he is visiting his sister. Riley, knowing Joe's sister to be deceased, returns to the rec centre late at night to confront Paul, but walks in on the angel, shedding its blood into a decanter. Upon seeing Riley, the angel attacks him, and therein ends episode four, with what is a fairly shocking moment. Were you expecting yeah. that? Not at all. Not at all. Because from the first episode, you assume that Riley is kind of the the main character. And it kind of, it is, it is and it kind of fades away. But you, you kind of, you know, we see a lot of him. So you don't assume that he is going to be attacked by the... Angel. The angel. <laughs> the horrible angel. What it, this episode is amazing because it shows that it really shows now the true the real true colors of bev which you you knew she was awful mm. but she's the worst person in the world like she walks in um father paul's um shack whatever house yeah whatever that is and sees um what's his name um paul pa not paul but the guy that he just oh, eaten his brain off joe Joe, which he's kind of, you know, Father Paul has helped him feel better about himself and like trying to not drink anymore. And he's really happy. He's having a moment. So he goes to Father Paul for um, to help him because he's, he's being tempted by alcohol because, you know, he's an alcohol. He's, he's, uh, he suffers from an addiction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And instead, <laughs> Father Paul just hugs him, and that's intense. Father Paul hugs him and hugs him and hugs him, and then he just drink, just like bites him in the neck, and then eats his brains. I don't know what it does. Yeah, well, yeah, that. And and then, as as a as a woman of God, Bev should come in and say, "Oh, this is not what you should be doing." Instead, she goes, "Guys." Put him in the <laughs> put him in the carpet and put him in the river. He was a bad guy. Yeah. That, that <laughs> I was so just like even that shocked me. I know she's a terrible person. And the fact that, that the the mayor and the other guy who I didn't expect him to be that way. He's horrible, isn't he? He ends up being really Yeah, he grim. ends up being one of the worst people. Mm. And they do it. 
because of this blind faith yeah. they have. Yeah. And I think it's just insane. This the your Father Paul has just killed a man and sucked his blood, whatever this man has done, he did not deserve this. And instead they think he was deserving because he was a he he has addiction problems. It was just and that was the moment it was like, yeah, I you're terrible people, real terrible people. Um because everybody's got a choice. Everybody has got a choice. And they decide to go the wrong direction. Hundred um, percent. The my brother pointed out to me how sort of darkly funny that scene is as well. In a way where she walks <laughs> yeah. in to just blood everywhere, and then Father Paul's just kind of sat in the corner, yeah. almost like oh, yeah. it wasn't me. I didn't do anything. Uh, <laughs> like, yeah, just, just look- drunk of blo- out of uh, like drunk with. Blood. It's like yeah. it's like when you walk in and your cat or your dog has done something awful, and he's just like uh, sat in the corner yeah. trying to pretend he's not there. <laughs> Yeah. It's just like no, you've you've done that. You've you've ate, you've drunk all that guy's blood. Um yeah. what do you think of the moment where the moment at the end where Riley gets attacked um and the angel rushes him in that way? I didn't yeah, I was like, ah, ah. <laughs> Yeah. Did you Is this the eh? Did you think that was the end of Riley or did you what did you think we were What? No. Well, I I thought it was the same thing was going to happen, like um, uh, Father Paul. Mm. I don't think Father Paul would have allowed him to die. No, true. Um, Is this the episode where they talk about death? I... I think so, because it's before he dies. Yeah, I think it is this episode. Yeah, it is episode four. Yeah, because they they pray for for her unborn child. Yeah. Mm. Um... Yeah, no, it is this one. Um, that is... Uh, those two monologues, one after the other, are too much. Yeah. It's a lot to get through. Um, yeah. But um, I guess it's setting us up for, you know, she's just lost a child and yeah. he is imminently... Well, we'll talk about it in episode five, but, like, there is cause to want to know what he thinks will happen after death. Yeah. Um. So it sort of adds yeah. a lot of character. Like all of these monologues add, add add a lot of character. Like there's, um, Rahul Kohli is the sheriff has a really amazing monologue where he talks about why he came to the island and why he's decided to be a sheriff and yeah. you know, kind of really enriches that character's story. Yeah. Um. Definitely. They they just are very long. They are extremely long. But it seems to be like Mike Flanagan's other work isn't filled with monologues in this way. It seems to be really specific choices made. For this show, particularly naming every naming every episode after a book in the Bible and having it feel mm. very li- literal, lit- literate, like literature, mm. it seems to really be pushing the mm. whole angle of it feeling quite you know authored and like a book, and that's I think why these huge long monologues are incorporated because it is outside his normal style and very much defines mm. this show. Um, yeah, but I like it. Yeah, definitely. But I think this is definitely this the the episode where you realise that this what where the shit hits the fan really. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> this is when you know the three episodes before kind of setting the scene, we realise what's happening, and then this is when you go, ugh. Yeah. This is the next after this. The next three episodes are. Intense. Yeah, well, then we go to episode five. Um, and so, yeah. Why have I not written down the name of episode five? Give me one second. Um, gospel. Oh, is that what it's called? Yeah. Okay, Gospel. So episode five is called Book Five, Gospel. Now, in The Haunting of Hill House and The Haunting of Blind Manor, episode five in both of those ends in a really spectacular and kind of rug-pulling moment. So Mike Flanagan devotees would be primed to expect something big to happen at the end of episode five, and it does. So let's get into <laughs> it. it. Does. Um, it does. Concerned over Riley's sudden disappearance, Erin files a missing persons case with Sheriff Hassan, who hypothesises that Riley may have relapsed or committed suicide. Lovely. On nice. yeah, thank you, Sheriff Hassan. On the evening of Good Friday Mass, Father Paul delivers a sermon rife with militaristic rhetoric, urging the congregation to prepare for war as soldiers in God's army. 
The homily upsets Mildred Gunning, whose physical and mental state has rapidly improved following Father yeah. Paul's visits. Later that night, Riley appears on Erin's doorstep and asks her to go offshore on a boat with him. Erin, while suspicious, agrees. Rowing far away from the island, Riley reveals what happened to him to Erin. Um, after being attacked by the angel, Riley rapidly recovered under the care of Father Paul, who revealed his true identity to him and told him that he believes the angel's blood is a gift from God and has been mixing it into communion wine to heal the residents of Crockett Island. Riley left the rec centre disgusted and deposited farewell letters for his family and Pruitt before visiting Erin. Riley tells Erin he brought her on the boat to isolate himself and declares his love for her. Riley combusts and quickly burns to ashes as Erin screams in horror as the sun rises. And the credits play, and they just allow us to continue to hear Erin's screams yeah. for like a good minute or so. Yeah. And it's yeah. horrifying. Yeah. And would be horrifying for Erin. Yeah. The fact that she even makes it back to shore for the next episode is <laughs> incredible. <laughs> Shows a, a, yeah. a lot of strength. Um, yeah. What did you think of episode five? Well, here it is clear that everybody has becoming younger. Yep, yep. Especially, like you and said, um, Mildred Gunning is quite, Mildred quite clearly Gunning. a young yeah. woman at this point, or becoming a young woman again. Yeah. And, and you realise here, because the biggest sinner at the beginning of the series... The big, the person that's the worst, let's say, mm. is um, Riley. Yeah. He's the worst person. Yeah, bad guy killed someone. Yeah, and he, uh, he's he didn't care about his family, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. However, in this episode, you see that he is not the the worst person because he does not want to be like Father Pruitt, not wanting to die. Because, you know, if you're a real religious person, like death, if you're a real Catholic person, you know, death arrives and, you know, you go up the clouds and you meet God and you're at the gates and every you've got eternal life. Mm -hmm. So what he's doing is going against his faith. Yeah, because for and selfish he, reasons. Like there's a very specific reason he wants yeah, to do all this, isn't there? Yeah, exactly. And but instead, Riley Flynn, instead of going, which in theory he's he could be considered a very selfish man and a very he could be doing the same thing as Father Paul. Instead, he chooses to die to save the person that he loves mm -hmm. and his family, which is amazing. I it was it's something that in a way unexpected of the character. If you see if you see the first episode and this episode, yeah. But I, I was I felt quite emotional by the end, and the fact that then he had found peace when he bu burst into flames. Mm. I I thought it was really deep moment, and kind of terrifying at the same time. <laughs> um, yeah, and and the fact that also the priest starts becoming worse. He's worsening. He's not the kind guy that was at the beginning. He's making, he's making an army, mm -hmm. which is a war, and that's not right. No. And, um, yeah, uh, it's fascinating how the, the good become bad here. Yeah, definitely. Um... Oh, disturbing, yeah, like really, really, really awful, disturbing stuff. Um, yeah, yeah. What do you think of, because I don't, because it's, it's a little while since I've watched this episode, what is happening with Mildred Gunning in this episode, the, the mother of the Doctor? Uh, I think it's the first time that she goes back to church. Yeah. And at the end of the sermon, um, she does not recognize uh, the man that she knew a long time ago, mm. uh, Monsignor Pruitt. She does not recognize him in his voice because I think she realized, has she already realized that? Yes, she realized that that is him. Yeah. And she does not recognize the man because he's tr trying to rage war against, for I don't know, for... <laughs> 
<laughs> he's trying to make up an army of something. Well, um, at this point, his his transition into being a vampire is like he's died yeah. and come back, so he he yeah. will have been altered in some way. Yeah. Yeah, so she says to her daughter that they will never return to that church mm. because it's dangerous. Such a good bit. And I love that moment. Yeah, yeah, and it's really dangerous and they will never go back. And, yeah. Uh, the actress who plays Mildred Gunning, Alex Esso, who is very young compared to, obviously, the character who's playing in this, um, starred in a movie called Starry Eyes, Um Mm. which plays a young aspiring actress who wants to make it big in Hollywood and gets involved in ritualistic sacrifice and, and things. And there's a lot of p- parallels between that film and ah. this, this show. Uh, she's great in Starry Eyes and I really, really like her. And I think she does such a good, like she has to initially do it through layers and layers of makeup, but as she becomes younger and younger as the series goes on, mm. I really like her character and the actor and like seeing her horror at the way Father Paul has like, led the island into this kind of doomed yeah <coughs> event is brilliant and the interactions like such an odd thing to see a mother and daughter where the mother ends up looking younger than the daughter and stuff and the, the like relationship between those two characters is is really well done um yeah. yeah really good stuff really really good stuff yeah should we go into episode six oh yes um <laughs> so episode six and seven are the wild. the <laughs> how wild um, <laughs> that's when you go what yeah. no <laughs> so <clears throat> we've got book six acts of the apostles erin returns to the island where sarah shows her the rejuvenated mildred and how her blood samples burn in sunlight theorizing that father paul is inducing medical miracles via the wine at church and erin's consumption of it is what killed her baby Mm. Uh, she relays her suspicion to the sheriff Hassan, who refuses to investigate the church, fearing further alienation from the locals. And I think that is this when you get his big monologue about um, nine eleven and when he became a, a sheriff. I think this might be yeah, yeah which is a yeah. really awesome part. Um, yeah, Erin, Sarah, and Mildred attempt to get the ferry to the mainland, but discover that Mayor Scarborough has sent the ferries away. That night, Sturge cuts power to the town. At mass, Father Paul reveals that he is Monsignor Pruitt, unveiling the angel to a shocked congregation. Um, oh, no. Shocked congregation is uh, putting it lightly. But it's scared shit, yeah. this congregation. <laughs> uh, Pruitt informs them that they all have the angel's blood and encourage them to drink poison to die and be reborn. Awful. Several residents drink it, including Lisa's parents, Sturge, Uka and Ali. Mildred shoots Pruitt and is attacked by the angel. Great bit. The undead churchgoers resurrect and attack those who have not drunk the poison. Ed is turned while Erin, Hassan, Lisa, Sarah, Warren and Annie escape. Erin shoots Bev and a resurrected Bev and Sturge unleash the undead churchgoers onto the remaining townsfolk. Yeah, this episode was intense. Yeah, this episode is is wild and like that's that that, yeah. that poisoning sequence is horrible yeah and as you realize what's but, happening it just becomes more and more difficult to watch but it's the fact that when when riley flynn finds out that he's you know going to become a vampire or he's a vampire he writes letters to his family mm. and and what really saddened me is the fact that his father did not believe him. Yeah. And that really made me sad because I was like, you, you, you have a letter. We don't really know what the letter says, but it, it's probably explaining the situation. And, and he goes to father Paul and he does not believe him. Um, I I found that really heartbreaking in a way because yeah. I, I, I thought that, you know, at least they would, and does Riley's Riley's dad drinks the poison, but Riley's mum doesn't? Is that no? Riley's dad gets attacked. Right. Yeah, and then when Erin Green goes to Riley's mum, she doesn't believe him her either, and it's just like, how can you go not believe, you know, these people? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's just that really made me really sad. And then they try to escape, and all the all the boats have been, um, you know, um, Erin Green and Doctor and her mother try to s- go to the mainland, but 
everything has been cut off. And uh, when, when they're in the church and they start drinking the poison, I did not expect that. So they start drinking the poison and they die. And then the doors are closed, so they start attacking each other. And I did not expect that. No, it, that was really weird. Yeah. I was like, oh my goodness. And this just, I was like, oh, this is a bloodbath. <laughs> and it was insane. I was shocked. Because that's the last thing that you want to happen. Mm-hmm. And he real. I think Father Paul realizes that. And then Bev runs away. Mm-hmm. <laughs> because she's awful. She's awful. Yeah. She's awful. Um, and, the, you know, at the, the moment where Mildred shoots Pruitt is pretty powerful. Yeah. And then the angel yeah. just screams, <laughs> launches itself at her. Horrifying. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was horrifying. And then what happens after is horrifying. Like, everything is just so horrible. Mm-hmm. All in the name of what? It's crazy. Yeah, like they lose sight completely of why they would. Yeah. Do, why they like? Why are they? Why? Why do they think this is what God would want? That they all. Yeah. Die and murder each other and. Yeah. It's yeah, it's, and I think the father Riley Flynn's father gets bitten, and so and then you know, but the mother can run away. Mm, yeah, is it? I think it might be. Just, it's almost as if Bev has just seen that Father Paul has done this. Is so devoted to the church that she can't imagine that. Father Paul would have done something wrong or evil, so just runs with and convinces Father Paul to run with that this is what they should be doing. And it's not. No, it's definitely not what they should be doing. Well, it's just horrific. And, you know, um, Sheriff um, Hassan has to see his son die and and <laughs> Get reborn again into this weird vampire thingy. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and then we go into the final episode. Book seven, yeah. Revelation. Uh, the now-turned Mildred reunites with Pruitt. The two were lovers years ago, and Sarah is their daughter. Pruitt mm. brought the angel to the island to rejuvenate Mildred so that they could have a second chance to be together. Erin and her allies set fire to the boats to prevent the turned churchgoers from leaving. Bev leaves, leads the turned on a vampirish, vampirish rampage, killing anyone they find. Pruitt, horrified by the violence, denounces Bev, and she denounces him as a false prophet. Bev orders her followers to burn down everything except the church and recreation centre, which she intends to use as a shelter from sunlight. Erin and her allies attempt to burn down the church and rec centre, but Sturge shoots Sarah, Bev mortally wounds her son, and the angel attacks Erin. Erin slashes its wings as she dies to prevent it from escaping. Oh. The churchgoers are appalled at what they have done and abandon Bev's cause. Ali burns down the rec centre, leaving no shelter for the turned. As dawn approaches, the remorseful townspeople gather to be immolated by the sun while singing Nearer My God to Thee, which is what the um, band on the Titanic played as it sank. Lisa and Warren, who rode offshore to avoid the carnage, are the island's only survivors. They watch the angel attempt to fly away, but notice its wings failing. Bev, Ali, Pruitt, Mildred, and the rest of the island's inhabitants die. As Lisa and Warren watch the island succumb to the fires, Lisa's legs become immobile again. And that's the end. This episode was insane. So, like, they go on a rampage at the beginning, and everybody's killing everybody, Mm -hmm. which is crazy. Yep. And... Bev is a horrible, horrible human, and she hates Erin Green. Yeah, she hates her. Yeah, and and then <clears throat> oh, and then um, Annie Flynn, which is so they're all like hiding in a house, and there's an amazing moment where Annie Flynn, she uh, Bev wants Erin Green to come out, but Annie Flynn goes, "No, I'm going out," mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and she just cuts her throat. She cuts her own throat. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's horrible. <laughs> what? No. <laughs> and and there is a sweet moment where Annie Flynn tries to find her husband 
um, what's his name? Henry? Henry? Well, no, she tries Henry to Thomas. find her husband. The actor's called Henry Thomas. I don't remember the character. Name. Yeah. She tries to find her husband and he goes, I haven't, I haven't killed anyone. I haven't drunk anybody's blood. It's okay. And they both like, they have this, they unite in their, in their, and it's really sweet. And he's like, oh, there's still humanity with these people. Um, and, uh, yeah. It's, and you, when, um, so Bev, I think, does Bev shoot the doctor? Doc, uh, Dr. Sarah Gunning? Th- Who shoots her? Is it Sturge? Sturge. Yeah, Sturge shoots Sarah. Sturge shoots Sa- Sarah. Yeah, Bev attacks her son. And, yeah, and then Dr. P- uh, uh, Reverend Paul, try the father Paul tries to give him her his blood so she can live and she just spits it out yeah because she doesn't want to ah oh, it's so strong it's just like so much like rejection of this disgusting thing that's happening from these people yeah, yeah. which are sacrificing themselves to save Lisa and Warren Flynn mm-hmm. which are the two young kids um and it's just for them which it just comes down to them. We need to save the kids, <laughs> and it's really and are, and like Aaron. Are mm-hmm. they even saved by the end? They're both stuck in a boat. Well, I guess they'll 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 find them. You know? Hopefully, well, hopefully, yeah. it's certainly not like a concrete happy ending for them or any, yeah. anyone. No, because everybody dies. Every single person on the island. Every single person, but children. they. But everybody <clears throat> finds some kind of peace by the end, yep. apart from Bev. <laughs> Bev is still trying to escape it. And by the end, like everybody's singing and like Father Paul and um, Mildred, you know, embrace and everybody's singing and in, they're ready for death. And Bev is trying to make a hole in the sand to hide herself. <laughs> So she'll be still alive. Ugh. So that means that she has n- her faith is not real. No, she has no faith. No. She's just a bigot. Yeah, she's just and awful. There's a great scene. I think what, is it in this episode where she starts picking out people to be killed. Just like yeah. literally, there's a guy who she just doesn't like. I can't remember the reason why. Yeah, she just picks him out to be murdered because yeah. she just doesn't like him. It's and yeah, because he hasn't been to church. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for years. Yeah. Oh. She's awful yeah. she's so awful yeah but the last scene is so moving and like um sherry vassan and her his son pray do their last like pray uh prayer mm-hmm. and uh yeah bev is just the worst she is yeah she is and that's the end and that's midnight mass and that's the end of midnight mass final positive A crazy feeling. ride <laughs> Final feeling. Um, he's a great writer. Uh, he really, he really is an intelligent writer. He's really good. Like I said before, he's there's. You know, bigots might think that this <laughs> would be against religion, but it's not. It's against the uh, the superiority that certain people feel if they're religious and Bev is the incarnation of all the people that believe they're better than other people because they go to church or they, I don't know, in the end, she's the worst. She's the greediest. She's the worst person. Whilst everybody else, which, you know, what, what uh, different um things of faith they have they still were much better people mm-hmm. than she was and it's very well done um and very entertaining and with very sad moments very thought inducing moments <laughs> a bit of angst some gore it's very good. It was a very, very good TV show. It's got everything you can possibly want, mm-hmm. and uh, really well done. I agree. Yeah, I agree with everything you just said. Yeah, it's it's fantastic. Um, hmm. 
I so I'm a I'm a big Mike Flanagan fan and was like really hyped mm. for this because of it. Will you watch any of his other stuff? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> I think this is probably the least scary one of them all. Um, because the- I'm looking at pictures of the other stuff, like the haunting of Bla- Bly? Bly Manor. Bly Manor. The Haunting of Hill House. There's a haunting. I'm not a fan of that. The Haunting of Hill House is as good as this, though. Okay. It's worth watching. It is scary in parts, but it's it's got the depth and stuff that this has. The Haunting of Bly Manor um, is not as good, but it, it's not scary as well. So if you wanted something that just wasn't as scary, you could watch that. Mm, did he do Doctor Strange as well? Doctor he Sleep? He did do Doctor Sleep, which you should definitely watch. I'll, 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 is, is it is it as scary as no no <laughs> is it as scary no, as uh, it's not um the shine no it's not scary really it's it's hard to Doctor Sleep's a hard one to describe and the book it's based on is rubbish but he pulls <laughs> he pulls an amazing movie out of it mm. I would really recommend that you watch the director's cut of that because it's split into chapters like this series is um, okay it's quite long the director's cut. And it's really, really good and not terrifying. It's got a couple of quite harrowing bits in it and stuff, but it's a really mm. great sequel to The Shining and, and I'd recommend you watch Doctor Sleep. In fact, it's your homework, so there you go, you've got to watch it. No, there's no homework <laughs> in our special episodes, I'm afraid. Um, <laughs> one of my one of my favourite things about uh like his work and stuff is that he He's been planning Midnight Mass for a long time to the point where yeah. the first film he made for Netflix is called Hush, uh, mm. where Kate Siegel um, plays a mute, deaf author who's being stalked through her house by a kind of masked assailant. Um, yeah, I can see the poster. I'm not watching <laughs> no. that. But she's a, she <laughs> is a novelist, and the, the yeah. novel that she is writing during the movie is Midnight Mass. No. Yeah, to the point where there's, there are bits of the film that that show some of the novel and stuff and reference what's happening in the novel, and it's like specific things like Erin slashing the angel's wings is mentioned in Hush, and you know other bits no. and pieces. Yeah, which is really cool. And then he made a couple of years later again for Netflix. He made Gerald's Game, which is a Stephen King adaptation. And in that, the finished novel Midnight Mass is a, appears in it as a prop, which is like thrown at another character or something at one point. <gasps> Isn't that just See, cool little? His mind is crazy. Yeah. He's ma- he's a very very smart man. Yeah, yeah. Very smart because it's you can see that this has taken a while to write. Yeah. It's not something just thrown together like that, yeah. which ne- never is. But it just looks like there's a lot of work behind yeah. this. Because and- I think he's an interesting guy. Because a lot of his stuff is quite flashy. And like Doctor Sleep is quite a flashy Hollywood production and very crowd pleasing. Mm. And I think for that reason, and he works with big studios like Netflix and Warner Bros and stuff. I think because of that, he doesn't get talked about in the same breath as people like Ari Aster or Robert Eggers. Mm. But I think he is adding just as much to the to the, like the, the genre world, like the horror genre and the, the, the world, of that whole kind of side of filmmaking as Ari Aster or Robert Eggers are. Just mm. doing it in a way that isn't getting in the sort of critical devotion that those other people seem to get. But I think he's just as talented as that. Like Midnight Mass stands alongside Hereditary or um, The Witch f- for me. I think I think yeah. it's I think it's an incredible piece of work. I I, I, yeah. I absolutely adore it. Definitely, and the casting. I think <sighs> I think the casting was really really good. Yeah. Like it's really well done casting. It's really yeah. Yeah, definitely. He yeah, like mm. Rahul Rahul Hamish Linklater obviously, but also Rahul Kohli in particular in mm. this show are great. Um, along with Kate Siegel, is you know his wife, who's always brilliant in anything that she appears in of his. Um, mm. and yeah, the rest of the cast are all strong. Uh, I can't remember who plays Bev. What's her name? <laughs> Uh, Bev uh, Samantha is... Sloyan. Sloyan. Yeah, which looks completely there from different from Bev. Yeah, that's, yeah. Because Bev looks like a horrible, hor. Ugh. Ugh. What a piece of garbage. Yeah, she. Yeah. Yeah, and she was in Hush as well. Was she? I did not know that. 
Mm, apparently. She's also in... Yeah. The Haunting of Hill House. Yeah. Yeah, she's pretty good. Ah, so I didn't realise that even the other ones that he did, Mike Flanagan, are like the the Haunting of Hill House and of the Haunting of Bly Manor are also series. Oh, yeah, yeah. Haunting of Hill House is a series. Bly Manor is a series. Um, mm. def- I mean, it's scarier than this, but I really think you should give Hill House a try. Um, if you if you get the uh, the bravery to do it, you've watched scarier things because of me. Uh, yes, <laughs> it's, a, it's your call. If obviously. I can, if I can avoid it, that would be that be. Um, but no, if you, I did, I did have a sleepless night after, after this one, <laughs> after Midnight Mass. Well, when Riley Flynn gets attacked by the yeah, that's pretty pretty. The, the, yeah, I was shocked. I was shooketh <laughs> by that. I was um, not, yeah. But Hill House and Doctor Sleep, if you were if, if you or anyone listening were wanted to watch more Mike Flanagan work, then those are the two things I'd point people towards. Because they're both great. What was the first thing that you ever seen of Mike Flanagan? Me, I think it was the haunting of Hill yeah. House. It was either H- no, I think it was Hush actually. Hush was the first thing of his that mm. I watched. And then I've been mm. back and watched Oculus, I think he did before Hush. Um, and he's got there's a couple of things of his that I haven't seen yet, um, mm. and it isn't all gold. I don't think the haunting of Bly Manor is great, um, but most of his other stuff I really like. Gerald's Game's really good. I can't remember what else there is, but it's all great. Cool. So, how how much would you give uh, this show? Five out of five. Five um, mm. buckets full of angels blood out of five. <laughs> what, what about you what about five. you yeah yeah good five a good five it's a good um good show good um good intelligent crazy show agreed um yeah. so other than midnight mass what from this week's culture catch-up would you recommend people check out uh, watch the second season of Russian Doll. Nice. Um, Definitely. I would recommend people... I mean, but Dr. Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, go and check it out. And Saga. Read Saga. Read Saga. Um, yeah. Uh, next week, please join us again for another top five. Uh, we're going to be counting down our top five favourite films or performances from... Um, one of our recent, um, an actor that we've talked about constantly recently because he's just so wonderful and great and everything he does, and that is Andrew yep. Garfield. Um, the top five Andrew Garfield performances. Can't wait to discuss his body of work next week. That'll be so good. Um, so, yeah, look look out for that next week, and please do go and rate and review us everywhere you can and help get the word out and recommend us to all your friends. Please, please, please. And uh, join us on Instagram um, and you can find the links to that social media platform and all our social media platforms, along with um, all of the things we discuss in Culture Catch on my tube in the show notes for this and every episode. So please do go look at that and uh, we'll see you again next time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.